Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We will be discussing uh, women in BIM. So a summary in the discussion of state of BIM and digital engineering in Australia. Uh, we welcome all of our attendees and we do hope that you uh, enjoy today's webinar. This is the first Australian based webinar of, of our kind. And we're really excited uh, to be together today as a team supporting and representing women in BIM in Australia. So today's session very much focused uh, as a panel discussion. And I guess to start with, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction on, I guess, the importance uh, of women in BIM and some of the initiatives surrounding women in BIM uh, today. So women in BIM is very much a, a global diversity group and we are aimed at supporting and representing, I guess, the, the, the women across the world who are working in BIM and digital engineering and those that are obviously trying to obviously bring in and support women in this space. We're running at a critical skills shortage at the moment um, and that skills shortage is really, uh, I guess, one of the reasons why the, uh, why the group came about uh, to begin with. So we're very much here to address some of those skills shortages and ensure that we have obviously a position in place uh, to support women in BIM globally. So at the moment, we have obviously a global database uh, of women in BIM and women in BIM across the world is very much uh, a global database. There are representatives from regions in the UK, in Australia, obviously uh, in, the, in the US and other regions. And therefore, um, I guess it's important to acknowledge that we are very much growing as a global diversity group. So this webinar today very much uh, focused on the uptake of BIM and digital engineering in uh, Australia. And we focused on Australia predominantly because there's been a, a lack of coherence in terms of, I guess, understanding what initiatives occur across our regions. So as the chair uh, of Women in BIM as a global group, I'm currently based in South Australia, but um, certainly acting as, I guess, the, the global chair and the Australian lead. So I will discuss a little bit in context to South Australia today, but very much we'll focus on our, um, our regional leads who have recently been appointed to support Women in BIM in Australia. So with that, I will pass over and introduce, uh, allow our panelists to introduce themselves. And we'll start off with uh, Belinda Thompson, who will introduce herself, give a little bit about um, her understanding of, of, of BIM and, and obviously um, you know, her role in industry at, um, at present. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm Belinda Thompson. I'm the WA BIM lead for GHD. I've been in the industry about 15 years now delivered some major projects as a, as a BIM manager. Forestfield Airport Link would be one of those. That was a, a milestone in, in my career. Um, I moved from sitting in the, an architecture uh, team to sitting in the transport space. And um, I guess that's been my focus probably for the past four or five years now. Thanks, Belinda. And we'll move over to Jenny, who will introduce herself. Thank you, Rick Beckhardt. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Dent, uh, the New South Wales Regional Lead. So I'm also uh, with a background of architecture, um, been in the industry for about 18 years, currently a digital project manager at Willow, uh, which is actually an information technology company. Uh, I work very closely with our DE team as well as our product teams together championing the adaptation of Digital Twin. Um, I've worked on some major beam delivered projects across healthcare as well as um, transport uh, and that's the main focus right now. Um, currently engaged uh, as part of the panel specialist uh, for Transport for New South Wales working on the DE framework. Over the last three years we have actually released and continue to push the industry adopt um, the better way, an improved way of, um, you know, implementing digital strategy and standardization of the of the informations and projects. So hopefully we can drive some better outcomes and yeah, glad to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. And Rachel Strauss. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. My oh. name is Rachel Strauss and I'm the regional lead for the Melbourne region. And I'm a BIM manager at a BIM consultancy called BIMCO. And um, our company offers a team where we lend um, a hand to mainly firms that are small, medium businesses, architecture, 
engineering and interior designing. And um, basically, yeah, we offer support, um, standards training, um, and even like create BIM content to make sure they um, um, achieve their BIM deliverables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rachel. And uh, Ligia Trindad. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, so my name is Ligia Trindad, and I am the regional lead for Brisbane. And my background is, is in architecture, but I've been working with BIM and digital engineering since 2012, and mostly in heavy infrastructure projects. I've been working in different areas within the industry, including design, construction, and beam consulting. And I arrived in Australia last year. Uh, I'm originally originally from Brazil. And after a few months, I joined Willow to work as a digital coordinator at Crossville Rail Project, which is one of the major infrastructure projects in the country so it's mm -hmm. a very exciting opportunity uh, especially because uh, Crossville Rail is the first infrastructure project in Queensland to adopt BIM on its full life cycle so as part of an initiative from the government to mm -hmm. push the industry so perfect timing to arrive in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> Um, I'd really uh, like to thank all the, the the ladies across the panel today because we've we've all known each other for some time, but I think just recently we're really starting to to get to know each other and understand our particular passions in BIM, particularly in this country, and certainly in the roles that we undertake, you know, as part of our um, as part of our services. So, um, I guess with that, the first discussion point I'd like to put to the panel is really how the different initiatives across Australia have been executed. We know that obviously there have been strong pockets of innovation and those strong pockets of innovation have certainly come from particular government uh, initiatives supported by you know, private uh, entities. But certainly, uh, I guess to, to start off with uh, Jenny, you know, on the development and push and maturity of, of DE and the DE effort, digital engineering effort across Transport New South Wales, I think that's probably been one of the most exciting uh, national uh, incentives really um, across our industry. And I guess, you know, in your, obviously in your role, you're really driving, um, you know, different components of that strategy and, and the benefits and challenges across government in New South Wales. How have you seen, I guess, the process unfold over the last few years? And what's your, I guess, take on, uh, you know, the current position of, of DE across transport? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I guess um, my involvement with the transport um, DE framework um, has been quite a journey. Um, obviously, uh, leading from the government side, um, I think that is actually the motivation from the government trying to drive an incentive for better capture things and smarter way of doing and deliver projects. And I think they, um, the DE framework is it's three years into its journey, but it's actually four years in the making prior to that, just to actually try to build a team within transport to facilitate the process and look at what gaps and how we can actually create that change management, I guess, from a, a government corporate uh, entity perspective. And um, it, it's, it's, it's probably um, trying to also change the mindset that it's DE and, and or the BIM is, is a collaborative way of doing things together. And we all have to actually make sure that we connect information and connect data in, in a way. So DE framework actually started um, at the early stages is literally just looking at the current landscape of what the government is at and trying to do a baseline approach uh, and a study on how we can improve the current uh, environment and then mm -hmm. look at what scalability we could achieve and uh, the, the critical component that is actually essential to support um, DE or BIM as kind of the first kind of a component. And throughout the last um, kind of uh, three years, I mean, we are up to release three now in publications. Um, it's on a public website. Uh, if you search for digital engineering, uh, transfer for New South Wales, you can go straight into the website. Uh, there are videos and there are, you know, how we actually perceive what the life cycle is using BIM and um, templates, guidance and standards that we actually have uh, established. Uh, and I think uh, in a nutshell is just to, uh, from a client perspective, uh, to be clear on the requirements 
and to be clear on the outcomes and what we are trying to drive. So, you know, all the service provider, all the consultants, all the designers have a way to be able to know what they need to do, um, uh, clear directions, and they can be innovative using, mm -hmm. you know, the Internet of Things or uh, all the innovations that we're driving from a digital point of view and to achieve the best outcome. And that can probably be insured, uh, reused and of uh, best quality. Um, and just it, one it, last note. Yeah, sorry, yeah, just one sorry. last note that we actually yeah. are about to um, get release four, hopefully before uh, in the next few weeks before the um, before the end of the year. I was just going to say, you know, the impact of obviously this year with the um, you know with the with the pandemic has certainly. Um, kind of put the brakes on some of the incentives across, um, you know, government in Australia, certainly with some of the potential funding. And, you know, that's, I guess, probably one of the questions that we might have at the end, you know, has there been an impact from COVID? And we will jump back on that, Jenny, in a second. But I will move to, to Rachel on that point as well, because certainly Victoria has been impacted quite heavily by, um, obviously, the impact of COVID. But um, prior to that, we saw some really exciting work being undertaken by obviously the Victorian government with the development of the Victorian Digital Asset Strategy. And, um, you know, as much as we're all kind of um, aware and understanding of that um, initiative, I mean, you know, what's your take on it, Rachel? Have you had um, much experience in, I guess, utilising any of that documentation yet? Or has it just been kind of understood more as a strategic framework across industry to date? Yeah, so I guess with the VDAS, so I guess the latest update from what I'm aware of from Office of um, Projects Victoria is that they released a guidance document earlier in the year. And that's, you know, approximately or about 300 pages um, outlining the strategy organisation and how to apply the digital assets to projects. So essentially how it's been written, it's targeted to stakeholders. So even if, you know, no one doesn't really have too much knowledge of like you know, digital assets, digital engineering BIM is kind of targeted to an audience where it's pretty user friendly in that sense. Um, so as far as I know, it's not mandatory as yet, but there are some departments that are, are embracing um, looking into these projects. So say, um, for instance, Delwood, which is the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, um, even like um, Melbourne Water, Land Use Victoria are onto it. and. And probably a project, a big project that's happening right now in Melbourne is the Fisherman's Bend Urban Renewal Project. And apparently that's supposed to be the largest renewal project in Australia where they're piloting um, the digital twins in, in that sense. And that's following like the guidance of like, you know, the VDAS strategy and all that. And mm -hmm. I guess in terms of like where it's headed, like in the government sense of things. So like, I guess we've got these guidance documents currently and I guess the next stage would be creating policy um, from these and even just looking at these pilot projects such as the Fisherman's mm -hmm. Digital Twin Project. But I guess, you know, being in Melbourne and Victoria, like we've been under very, very strict lockdowns at the moment, but like us and our team have been working from home since, um, since March. And I guess, you know, at the same time, we've had to, pretty much nearly all businesses in, in here have had to digitise processes that we have to um, work around and all of that. And mm -hmm. even like, you know, with BIM and all of that, like I reckon it's mm -hmm. thriving at the moment just because of that. Sure. And and it's funny because in, in South Australia, certainly the work that I've been doing in industry here with running different initiatives, we've found that um, with the impact of COVID, certainly building contractors and, you know, design teams have been forced, obviously, to work differently. And although, I guess, for your interest, um, there are no kind of strict requirements for BIM and digital engineering in, in South Australia, there have been, you know, quite a few, a, a high number of projects that are implementing some of the BIM technologies across different government projects. And certainly, they are aligning to, um, you know, to the international standard um, ISO 19650. So, we are seeing that not only obviously, you know, obviously Vic Victoria and New South Wales very much have been leading the charge, but, you know, slowly, slowly, I think, you know, some of the other states, you know, are coming round um, to a degree. And that's why I think it's interesting to talk about how the different initiatives uh, relate to each other, because I think it's really important we start to share 
lessons learned. I mean, in, in WA, Belinda, do you think um, in terms of some of the work that you've been undertaking, I mean, how far has been really, really been pushed aside from on some of the large scale uh, projects that we might have uh, read about? Look, I think that um, the large scale projects have been what's driven it. Um, mm -hmm. From a government point of view, I, I don't think that WA is quite there yet. Um, mm -hmm. There's no real guidance. There's no no documentation as such that's been released that kind of points to a digital engineering or BIM deliverable um, or methodology. Uh, Public Transport Authority is probably far ahead of, of the other um, government bodies, I guess, because they've had these major infrastructure projects. They asked for, for BIM on Forestwood Airport Link, probably not necessarily getting the outcome that they wanted, but that's probably a level of understanding that they just didn't have. Mm. So they are now um, working to rewrite their digital engineering framework. So things like BIM specification, um, is being updated to actually probably be a little bit more relevant to how projects are being delivered now, which is fantastic. Metadata standards are in development for the whole of, of the Public Transport Authority software templates um, outside of just CAD um, and the CAD deliverable side are also being looked at, asset handover processes and templates, um, common data environment as well and, and how it ties back to their asset management systems and also right. just generally how um, data use is within PTA. So um, it, that's one body that is actually making a, a push towards uh, digital engineering and, and standardising how their projects are delivered and being able to use the information for the entire project mm -hmm. lifecycle, which is fantastic. Our biggest, um, I guess the, the biggest push that I've seen is still major projects. It's not necessarily the smaller projects, but it relates back to the constructors. The constructors are the ones that are wanting it. They're finding the benefits on site to be able to use the, the digital tools, um, find their, their programming, cutting cutting costs, looking at their procurement chain. So your, your CPB, Lendlease, Lang O'Rourke are driving it from a constructor point of view. And, and as a consultant, that's usually who, who we're delivering to. Um, mm -hmm. So that is, something that I've seen widely spread across many different sectors within WA. I think WA and South Australia are really similar in that space because, again, some of the large um, engineering companies across this state certainly are pushing BIM and digital engineering in the same way, you know, looking at, you know, the construction process, how some of the tools, you know, implementation of some of the more automated tools can start to mm -hmm. affect their workflows. And I think that's a really, you know, that's a really good, piece of information it's it's good development across industry although not strategic and I think you know coming from you know the background that I come from which is very much a st the strategic implementation um, of BIM you know looking at the different incentives I think we will we will slowly we will slowly get there because we just have to and you know that's why we've seen obviously the New South Wales uh, the Victoria and and now you know more recently um, you know, it was the development of the, the Queensland um, BIM policy. And I know, Ligia, you touched on some of those points earlier. But, I mean, how has, I guess, industry um, grasped some of those concepts? I know you said on the Cross River Rail project, certainly BIM has been implemented in line with um, some of those requirements. But I guess, can you give us a bit more detail around what you've seen in that space? Yes, sure. Uh, so the, the Queensland BIM policy is, is relatively new in its mm -hmm. development but what i can say is that for example the, it was uh, the queensland government being guideline guideline was, was released mm -hmm. in july this year so this document is not uh, mandatory but it refers to to other standards international and national and other beam documents from New South Wales and Victoria. And it's basically uh, a, a way to, to guide the, and help the agencies agencies to understand the, the appropriate approach to address an issue uh, and, and, and generally for, it's only for information. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have, um, uh, mandates, pro, uh, proper mandates yet, but uh, uh, the way the, the government is really committed to to the BIM implementation until uh, 
until 2023. Mm -hmm. So, sure. uh, so from July uh, 2019, the use of BIM is mandatory on the full life cycle of the major projects over $15 million, uh, which includes uh, Cross River Rail, which was the the first infrastructure project uh, mm -hmm. to to adopt BIM in its full uh, life cycle. So what's it's the stage that, in that? What's the stage of that project? Sorry, just quickly to interrupt. I and mean, where are you guys at with the with that project in terms of the implementation? Yeah, we we are starting the, the construction and 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 finishing the the design. Mm -hmm. So some mm -hmm. pro, some packages are. At, uh are being issued from con construction. We have different uh, stages of the de development in the design. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really is really I'm really happy to be part of this project because uh, it's it certainly can can drive the beam uh, adoption through how other infrastructure projects and as a reference for information requirements and and the future beam mandates in the mm -hmm. in Queensland. Certainly there's been um, alignment again with the BIM policy in Queensland and obviously New South Wales and Victoria to ISO 19650. As much as we don't have I guess, um, a good understanding of the relevance of that standard across Australia. I guess the, there, there is a, you know, obviously the working groups supporting the development of the regional annex for ISO 19650 to, I guess, govern um, and push and drive that, that consistent consistency. I mean, how closely, Jenny, um, are, are you guys aligning uh, some of your strategies around the development of that suite of standards? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when we started the journey, I think um, that was actually prior to ISO 19650 even being done. I think we started looking at PASS 1192 mm -hmm. and then ISO came about. So we actually are actually always reviewing. I think we treat that as obviously like the fundamental layer to start um, um, looking at ways of actually connecting information and how we actually built our document like you know the the management plan the execution plan and what clauses that actually need to be managed and controlled and governed uh, in the DE standard and requirements so it's critical for us to 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 continue on actually um, reflect on what's that because it's such a good document um, and it's actually an international standard so we always go for that as a first reference tier one mm -hmm. and then you go into the state and national obviously and and if i say we also have touch point with the various of state like victoria and queensland government to ensure um if we start with iso and then we start uh, we, we we open the communication between the state we can start to see a synergy um, appear between the different uh, government policies and we can be able to um, look at a more consistent approach of how we actually achieve the outcome of driving DE if not being in all our major projects. So it is fundamental and but one thing I will touch base on is there's a, there's also the layer of the organizational requirements that we cannot, cannot dismiss and must ensure that we are also making sure we align with the commercial requirements as well as different um, divisional requirements and departmental requirements within the organizations and I guess that's probably where the challenge comes in because you have to be um, you have to have a, a standard approach but yet you have to also support uh, a slight flexibility and, and, and variations to support different programming in, in, in I guess um, divisional work. Sure, sure. And I think that's one of the challenges, isn't it? It's it's aligning to, I guess, the existing asset um, management strategies and policies around different government departments and what those government departments are really trying to achieve in terms of, you know, their asset management space. And I think, you know, that's been a universal problem, you know, for BIM and, and digital engineering across the board. And this is, again, you know, why I think as much as the international standard and the suite of international standards can, can help us to consolidate some of those processes, certainly we still need to be uh, client slash organisational focused. 
um, on those incentives because you know certainly in um, in the UK that's been a really strong driver you know what are the existing asset management policies and, and you know the data requirements for different assets you know, and how can we achieve those I guess those requirements for BIM. Uh, one example you know and, and, and in terms of the work that that I've seen um, in South Australia is really looking at, you know, what are the entities or the organisations managing uh, the assets into their operational phase, and what is the data that you know that they have access to, and generally the data they have access to is, you know, as we know, antiquated, um, generally paper-based um, and disjointed. And again, that's one of the key ingredients to why BIM should be implemented to bring that all together. And certainly, I know you've been doing a lot of that, uh, you know, Gem, with your work. So. I guess with with the I guess with the, the the work in in Victoria, Rachel, have you seen any of your clients specifically look at um, asset specific data requirements or anything around more so on the operational phase, or has it just been very much design and construction focused? Yeah, I guess on our thing, um, I guess you know most of our clients are in the design phase. So, um, auto in saying that, you know, we have um, looked at facilities management and all of that. Um, I guess it depends on, because we deal with a lot of like private projects and stuff, it also depends on the contract of the building. So say for sure. instance, like you know, the contract of like, you know, a skyscraper where we're doing internal fit out for, um, they might have um, guides on, you know, what the Kobe data and all that and the level of detail of all the elements that are put into to the fit out project. So then it just, it, it pretty much driven from like, you know, the rules of like the building as well. And um, I guess in terms of um, like, I guess um, if you look into maybe the future of what, you know, might be happening in, in um, Victoria and stuff, I know for a fact um, the government invested like um, 45 million or so in a digital um, cadastro modern, modernization project. So I guess that what that entails is like, you know, looking at the property, lines you know the boundaries what easements are there and all that and i guess if that information is available at the start of a project especially mm. that will kind of drive maybe what you know the design process will be like for what your development is later on down the track so like i guess with that information right there at the start it will kind of you know shape what the project will be in the future i reckon so yeah sure um, so that's something that the government is doing and um i guess you know in the next few years we'll find out what you know the update for of that project is yeah i think that's one of the key um one of the key ingredients i guess to the success of these policies is looking at some of the pilot initiatives and the pilot processes you know in terms of the application of bim and digital engineering processes technologies etc cetera, etc cetera. and again we're seeing a little bit of that here uh in south australia and and i'm certainly keen I guess to know more, um, you know, more about what, um, you know, how, how South Australia, because this is where I'm based at the moment, you know, can start to drive some of those um, initiatives. And I guess one of the things, I just to take a quick pause, because we're kind of halfway through our webinar, we'd really like to know from you as an attendee where you're based and if, um, and, and really where you're based in terms of um, your location. And so therefore we've got a quick poll and there's only five, um, fields that are able to be um, selected. So if you do select other and you're one of the other states or you're an international attendee, please um, can you enter into the chat dialogue box where you're located? Because for us as women in BIM, but also really for our knowledge, we're really interested to know, I guess, where everybody is across this country. And also um, the second bit of information we wanted to gather for women in BIM, um, you know, was also, um, you know, how, um, you know, how we, I guess, understand the maturity of BIM and digital engineering across Australia. So one of the projects that I'm initiating in South Australia that some of you may have heard about um, is the state of, we're calling it the state of BIM and digital engineering project, where we're looking at um, where BIM has been implemented across this state and pulling out some of the data based on surveys we've sent to industry, as well as roundtable events that we were able to host prior to our lockdown today. Um, and that's been a really exciting journey for us to really kind of pin down where the where the pockets of of innovation are. And certainly, uh, the NBS has put together some of those um, uh, some of the initiatives around surveys to gather data on, on Australia. But it, it just wasn't enough to to understand, I guess, in a bit more detail where we are. So, um, I guess the next poll, um, really quickly, is you know what is your understanding 
um, of BIM and digital engineering. And as much as we were halfway through the, um, the webinar, I think it's really important uh, that we gather again this data to help us with our research and with our implementation as women in BIM um, across industry. And, and after the second half of the webinar, we'll talk a little bit about what our women in BIM projects are for, for next year potentially and what they look like. So I'll give it a few minutes to collect responses and I guess I'll in, in the meantime um, I'll move to, um, to, to to Belinda again in terms of the um, I guess some of the initiatives in WA for, for education and skills growth in terms of BIM and digital engineering. I mean I know you've been involved in um, events in the past and some of those events obviously have been on hold but I mean what's what, where does industry go in terms of you know their um, understanding of BIM and digital engineering and, and in terms of learning and education? Look, I, I I think that Western Australia has has made a, a step in the right direction. Um, one of our universities, um, University of Western Australia, mm -hmm. has a master's in BIM modelling, which is um, has been available for a couple of years now. Uh, I think it's targeted more at um, architectural graduates um, than than anyone else, although it is open to to anyone that mm -hmm. that is that fits the criteria. Um, that's a step in the right direction. It's got lecturers from industry that have delivered on big projects within Perth. So it's got people that have been hands on delivering the 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 BIM projects and the digital engineering projects that have happened in WA. So, you know, people that have delivered our stadium, which was which was an awesome um, digital engineering exercise. People mm -hmm. from the transport industry, we've got a, a lot of um, transport infrastructure projects on at the moment, major transport infrastructure projects at the moment. Our Metronet is, you know, a, a few billion dollars worth of, if not more, um, worth of, of, of project delivery um, and we have people that are, have come from that background and are now actually educating the people that are interested in the people coming through in the universities. Sure. Um, I, I believe that Curtin University also has uh, added a, a focus on um, I guess modelling and coordination and construct constructability so that's good to see that, that that's being pushed now mm -hmm. at a at an educational level rather than coming out and perhaps not knowing that you know you, you need to understand what's going on with the engineers if you're an architect so that you can actually design and develop um, great mm -hmm. buildings or, or great infrastructure so that's two areas that are um, definitely pushing forward um, from from a an education perspective mm -hmm. we've still got our our typical TAFE um, I guess uh, diplomas where it is leaning towards more being a, a it was a drafts person I suppose and, and now it's more of a designer or modeler and, and they focus on the technology perhaps not so much on the actual BIM management side of things um, it would be great to see uh, a, a push towards the actual BIM management side of things um, or, the, or the digital engineering mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. um, understanding the data, the metadata, the processes, all, all of the stuff that you that people don't really think about. They 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 look at BIM or they think of BIM as, hey, it's delivering a project with a model, and maybe that model will be used for other purposes later down the track, without actually looking at all the standards and and the reuse and and how things can be used for the future. And that's certainly one of the challenges in terms of attracting young people to industry. One of the key, I guess, ambitions for women in BIM is to ensure that we have, you know, a, a future uh, which encourages, you know, a diverse industry. And that industry um, globally requires different levels of skill. And I think one of the uh, challenges, and I spoke to, to someone recently about this, was that young people just don't they just don't understand what it means to be you know, a digital engineering uh, technician or a digital engineering leader, a BIM manager, et cetera. So I think really it's our, um, uh, it's our responsibility to ensure that mm -hmm. we're educating, I guess, as industry professionals, educating these young people in terms of career choices. But I guess to bring it back to, um, you know, to, to the go government, you know, drivers, I know that there's Again, different initiatives around education. Certainly, with the VDAS, I know there was a there was a kind of section on the website that documented um, the different education providers for for VDAS and and certainly for New South Wales. But have you seen much around that, Ligia, in terms of the Queensland uh, BIM policy for education and training uh, for industry more than anything? Yeah. 
um, so for Queensland, uh, there is the QUT University here, uh, and we have some some uh, specialists in this area. But uh, I'm not aware of all the educational initiatives. Uh, I can I, I can talk about the Cross River Rail project and how mm -hmm. uh, the Queensland government have procured government to, to support this initiative. Uh, if you want to move to this subject. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that, as I mentioned before, BIM is already mandatory for Cross River Rail. And I think that this top-down approach is really important to drive its implementation. But at the same time, I feel that there is a bottom-up approach. Uh, and I feel that the, the team as a whole is being fully supportive uh, and recognize the value of BIM in the, in the project. So I think that uh, so because Cross River Rio is the first project in Queensland to, to be delivered in BIM, uh we can contribute to the, the next projects and government standard, standards as actually a case study especially for asset information requirements as rachel mentioned before mm -hmm. so and we have also the some communities here in brisbane for example brisbane which is a, a community that is providing feedback to the Queensland government on their recently released uh, BIM guideline. So I think it's a, a collaborative effort from, from the in industry as a whole. Yeah, because I had a conversation about that just recently, actually, that obviously there are the different communities across Australia that, that, that are really trying to drive the innovation in BIM and digital engineering. And some of those communities, Brisbane particularly, are very much supporting, um, you know, some of the government objectives and, and advising really on some of those government objectives. And really that's, I think, what, um, you know, some of these industry groups really need to be uh, pushing because one of the things that we've, um, I guess that we, we really need to be driving and again I'd like the panel's opinion on this is how we share lessons learnt across uh, the different uh, jurisdictions because obviously our state jurisdictions very much uh, you know historically don't share as much as they could right so um, you know how do we change that you know and how do we start to document lessons learnt on projects and then feed that back to the industry and I know Jenny you guys are doing a great job with the with the transport for New South Wales um, initiative, obviously, on with the website and all the stuff that you're communicating. But I mean, if you guys, do you guys have any mechanism for sharing some of those lessons learned back to the industry? Yeah. Um, so I think maybe I'll start with what um, when we started looking at the framework. Um, being a D framework, it's more than just pu putting out uh, standard and requirements. I guess one of the things we all realise is there's currently a skill shortage on uh, how people actually can actually drive. Um, DE, if not um, digital engineering and uh, and beam um, across not just vertical and technical front, but also you know across the management side of things. So transport, when we developed the um, standard, we actually devised and planned uh, training modules to support the the transport internal project teams as well as contractors and service providers they are implementing and delivering the DE um, projects. I think that in itself is actually providing the context and how and the learning across um, how information can be then uh, more shared and, and, and approaching a consistent way. And then every quarterly um, we also um, engage with the industry with a community of practice events hoping to draw I guess um, you know the best practice and innovations that currently has been driving um, from a project perspective, feeding back to um, the client side, as well as um, feedback from what transport as a client seeks in, in terms of the outcome uh, on projects. And I think that uh, becomes part of that collaboration that we all talk about, because we can't just work in silos anymore. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in a way you're looking at, you know, from vertical point of view, how we can actually, you know, make sure 
each of the disciplinary years really working and sharing information, but also across the different um, multimodal projects, we're also learning of each other how we can actually approach this um, the projects in a consistent way on requirements. And mm -hmm. that learning is is provided, I think, um, currently bespoke um, from a transport internal framework uh, on okay. trainees, but also, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that I know that uh, universities looking at um, digital engineering courses and curriculums, which mm -hmm. uh, we have, you know, touch points on, and we hope, I guess, um, we can actually have a bit more um, influence and, and be able to actually empower more of that. Um, you sure. know, use our platform in in, in, in our um, Umin Beam as well as I guess um, when we have more projects coming on board, delivering DE and and provide more lessons learned back and, back and forth both ways. Sure, yeah. I mean that's, you know one of one of the key um, uh, I guess challenges, and you you hit the nail on the head with skills shortages. I mean that's a global dilemma, and again mm. one of the key um, incentives I keep mentioning that. that it's a key kind of driver for women in BIM. Certainly why I created the group to begin with was to ensure that we do start to communicate to these young people. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, a, a, a linear career path. I mean, your career path could bleed mm -hmm. into different um, areas, different sectors, et cetera, which is why I'm really pleased. I was really pleased to see um, the launch of, um, in South Australia, the Digital Engineering Apprenticeship. And I wanted to mention that mm -hmm. today for two reasons. One, because there's been nothing like that in Australia um, in the past. And secondly, it really targets school leavers, young people, you know, those young people that aren't, that aren't interested in, you know, heading off straight to university uh, to, you know, to, to, to study a particular a particular discipline. So the Digital Engineering, Pro Digital Engineering Apprenticeship Program, certainly um, we want to, you know, very much support as, as women in BIM, I think, because it's something that, you know, would hopefully start to bring in different types of young people yep. to our industry. Maybe, you know, people that are more interested in, in, in I guess, the technology side and, and, mm -hmm. and linking that into, you know, what the future might look like for them. But certainly, I mean, for women in BIM, I guess, you know, we're all really passionate in bringing in more women. I mean, I guess, uh, Rachel, you know, what, what's your take on how we encourage, I guess, uh, more young women to enter careers in this space? Because, you know, as much as we have our differing, I call them pro women, women in BIM projects around the world with mentoring and, you know, hosting events and stuff, there's still not enough young women entering these careers. Yeah, like I think, um what you guys mentioned before about skill shortages and I think the importance especially for someone that wants to have a career in BIM is um, networking. So networking is very important and I guess you know you know BIM is a very small industry like it's very likely someone knows someone and like you know even if you throw a name we would have heard of them or we know them already. So like I guess um, for um, you know young people that do want to have a career in this yeah i guess it's just keep in touch with you know you know with you know everyone and stuff and you know even people in in the industry um get in touch keep in contact and i guess you know another thing um in terms of like education so i guess in in victoria like it's kind of only been the last couple of years where um the um i guess the government has especially noted that you know there's there's a need for for um, education in in this um, industry specifically, because I guess you know they recognise the importance of digital assets in shaping the future of like how the state will be. So so I guess what in my opinion, like what I guess would happen is that there will be a lot of demand for BIM and um, digital engineering um, skills out there, and then obviously the skill shortage will be, you know, a bit worse off like in the future like you know it seems mm. like you know technology works very fast as well so i mean although that, you know you know there's these projects happening right now but like the facts you know what what could be in the next five years like what's the next thing you know so yeah we'll just yes. have to wait and see yeah. It's really interesting, but Belinda, you first, sorry. I was going to say, I find it fascinating that the majority of us have come from an architecture, architecture background, right? Um, yeah. But and and we're not alone. Um, most of the people that that I speak to that are, have forged ahead in a, in a digital engineering or BIM um, career path have come from 
from architecture or from a kind of a digital design background. So you're drafting, you're drafting background. Um, I'm not sure what made us all choose the path that we chose, but I'm sure that we have plenty of false starts before we got there. Um, I, I remember kind of looking at it and going, okay, I can go down this way and I can, I can do that or I can do this. I did this for a bit and then I went, no, actually, I, I do, I do have a true interest in in technology and emerging technologies and delivering projects better. Um, to have moved from an architecture background to sitting in in a in a transport space delivering transport projects predominantly, I learned so much. Right, I didn't know anything about trains or tunnels, mm -hmm. or <laughs> I didn't even know what software. Um, they used right to deliver these kind of civil projects um, and and to be honest I still only can skim the surface on it but yeah I, I think it doesn't matter what your background is or where you're coming from if you've got an interest in it then you need to pursue it and this is why the and and I have to give a, a shout out for our, one of our core team members in the UK Katia Belava who's been instrumental in the mentor scheme that we've initiated for women in BIM because We've, if you don't know about it, we've had a, um, a certainly a pilot mentor scheme this year where we've actually accepted applications for mentors and mentees, um, and bringing in obviously, um, you know, some of the people from people from around the world, effectively, in um, in mentoring because again, like you said, you know, none of us really know, knew what path we would we would take, and I think, you know, we di we divert a little bit from today's conversation but I think it's really it's very very important and it's very relevant particularly for women in BIM because so many young people young women particularly you know do generally fall into these roles you know and do require that support and I think we all very much can act as mentors certainly for some of that those younger some of those younger women but I guess to step back um, and probably finish up with a with one of the last discussion points for today and then we'll move to questions is you know how do we um, you know how do we start to um, unify I guess you know because different governments across the world are looking at different BIM and digital engineering incentives and very much um, are aligning and bringing together a unified approach for BIM and digital engineering across industry. Um, certainly, the, the the user groups, so the the Brisbims and the Melbims, are doing a great job in communicating a consistent message for Australia and and also obviously um, you know that the, the uh, specification body NATSPEC and ABAB, which has again been in place to support that level of consistency and driving that level of consistency across government. But I guess in industry, how do we how do we start to um, I guess influence the next the next steps? Because you know, for me, it's about um, my example is you know continuing to give examples of the different is initiatives across the world, looking to not only the UK, because we keep looking to the UK, but looking at other regions that are really driving innovation and technology um, on a strategic level and starting to push those types of things, um, certainly across industry. But I guess the question to the panel is, you know, how, how do we consolidate that message, you know, in Australia for BIM and digital engineering? Because again, I think, you know, and most people would agree, maybe that are attending today's webinar, there is a, a slight, you know, disjointed message out there for what's happening across the country. Jenny, I'll start with you. <laughs> Um, it's a very good question, Rebecca. Um, I, I was just thinking about it while you were talking about it and hoping that you didn't actually uh, ask me <laughs> first. I guess um, I mean, fundamentally yeah. um, what we're trying to achieve in principle and in concept actually are the same. And what we are trying to drive is the same. It's just that I think we haven't actually had any leadership in the industry or in the government side to actually help us drive their directions in a coherent way. So I think now that the government are starting to align themselves and industry are looking obviously at uh, the ways of approaching the same thing. And I'm pretty sure all the major players industry will have presence across the state. And, you know, like ourselves, we also um, start having conversation and, and look at how we can align ourselves in terms of how we can empower our community. Um, it's, it's, I don't have a straight answer, but I think if we can make sure that obviously the sharing, the collaboration, the continual conversation, keeping it open and and making sure we feeding back and the learnings and the development of the progress of the things. Because I think we, we are um, very motivated and certainly is now a momentum in Australia. 
as a nation. Uh, we are starting at a very, very early stages, obviously, and um, the more we can share cross-learning and communicate with each other how we approach things, um, will probably certainly open that um, kind of conversation up and make ensure we actually align ourselves on the way going there. Um, but yeah, I guess um, make, maybe make, making people more aware and recognize what we do. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly the conversation I see today was not what I anticipated 10 years ago yeah. uh, when I'm having um, starting through my um, you know uni days. So yeah. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah. Yeah, I think that Thank as you. as Janie said, I sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think that collaboration and networking within the industry is is the is the key, you know, as a whole I mean professionals companies government bodies uh, and other beam communities so i think that uh, we need to act actually as consultants like overviewing and helping uh, in the development of beam policies and standards together with the government and other communities mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and having that as you know you mentioned already, it. Happening. Exactly. And you mentioned it, Jenny, where it's got to be on a strategic level, right? So, you know, having that strategic leadership effectively across, um, you know, across the the, the, the board, really. And, and I guess that that's where I saw the success in the UK BIM policy, because that was driven as one government, one government strategy as a mm. whole. And I think that's why it, it essentially worked, even though there's still obviously challenges, but um, you know, having that one government incentive across the entire country very much unified the approach, because certainly Australia and the US have the same challenges, different scale, but very similar challenges, similar um, because of the different state government initiatives and the jurisdiction around state government initiatives. Um, yeah. But I mean, what do you think, uh, Belinda? I mean, do you think that, that, that we can unify? I mean, obviously with Women in BIM, we're trying to do that certainly with our group um but 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 what do you think with the industry as a whole look it, it's difficult um jhd has 10,000 plus people across i don't know nine countries 10 countries something like that um i'm in a, a second role that i have is as the revit software manager globally so just trying to get the uk and north america and the middle east and australia all doing a single process the same way is a challenge. Um, trying to unify, I guess, all of Australia where we have our state governments doing different things and then sitting within the state governments, we have just government bodies that are doing different things. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like an impossible challenge, but I do believe that things like ISO 19650 will, will bring about a unified approach, mm -hmm. but it has to be not necessarily mandated within Australia, but it has to be driven from from project. Um, and and from the the more that we deliver to a standard like that, the more frequently we do it, the more it becomes business as usual. Um, totally so there's no there's no question about it. it. It is this is just how we deliver. Um, and and I know within GHD that is our approach. Our approach is that we deliver a digital outcome as business as usual, unless there's a reason to divert from that. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, I think look, we've had some amazing discussion points, and I think there's quite a few um, questions and comments that I'd really like to, I guess, um, record for today's session and. Um, one of the first comments is, you know, that that it's been, you know, a, a lot of positive comments, you know, great discussion points and learning about BIM. Certainly, uh, for those who don't have an understanding of BIM and digital engineering, um, and I guess one of the um, one of the early questions today was, you know, as in the architectural space and um, working in architecture and then pursuing a, 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 I guess, a career into the construction management space. Um, you know, what's the best way to enter the BIM, the BIM space? You know, what's the best way to, to get into, I guess, a career in BIM? Um, Rachel, what do you think? Um, look, I guess it depends on like experience and all of that. Well, not really experience, but like striving to, to look at um, where you want to go in, in terms of your career. Um, 
I guess like something that I um, brought up before is like networking as well. Like um, essentially like, um, yeah, keep in touch with us or anything. We might know someone that might be mm -hmm. looking into that. Um, you know, just try and get like volunteer experience even or um, mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. So just, yeah, I guess mm -hmm. skill up, you know, there's a lot of um, training out there, like even on like YouTube or Linda or anything like that. So just to get, um, yeah, I think it's just the, the big thing is just to get in touch with the person, really. Um, and I think I think it's awareness. Go. Mm. And I think it's like awareness of, of where they where people look because we know where to look. We know what networking events occur and you know where they're advertised mm. and how to find them. And I think you know certainly for for me, I mean, Christ, the, the the BIM community in the UK, we had networking events, you know, every few weeks, you know, back in the day. So the amount of networking we did to understand and connect with people was was incredible. And I think in Australia, not so much, but still, you know, I think once the COVID stuff um, eases up and restrictions ease up, certainly networking and attending networking mm -hmm. events is a key ingredient and finding out about them really it's all about social media right looking to social media um certainly becoming a member on our website with the women in bim website um because we often advertise what events are occurring and we partner with different industry events to ensure that we communicate um you know some of those things because um most uh, many of the comments through um the question dialogue box for today's webinar are, are how school leavers or young people um, I guess, get, gain awareness as to where to go, you know, where to look for these yes. sorts of um, careers, which is why I'll, I'll bring it up again, the digital engineering apprenticeship um, for school leavers is is one way. And that's been advertised all over SEEK, all over um, most yeah. of the recruitment uh, websites as well. Um, another comment was that, um, you know, perhaps we could create uh, flyers, which we certainly have. We have flyers that we, we use, digital flyers that we use, and, and it's, um, a recommendation is maybe we can create regional flyers for, for women in BIM for high schools, and that can potentially open up, um, you know, opportunities for young people in schools, because I know there's a lot of work around career, uh, career days, and that's also a great, um, a great idea. But maybe, um, I guess for you, Belinda, you know, somebody's asked without an architectural or digital background, you know, what, what's the first step to get into the BIM space if you don't come from that um, background and, and um, maybe you're in project management or you have basic um, drafting skills? How do you get into it? Look, I'm still not sure how I got here. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that it's the same. <laughs> Yeah, um, all of us. <laughs> I, I, I'm asked to to bring on some grads and and train them up, right? And, and I kind of go, they're not going to want to do what I do every day. It's it's how can I explain what I do? I I chase emails basically it, it, from a strategic sense. It's answering one email after the other and just putting out fires. Or you know, my day could be uh, putting together a PowerPoint presentation for half the day, and then the other half of the mm. day I'm sitting in meetings. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I, I, look, for, for me, where, where, where it all started was learning learning Revit, if, if I'm honest. Um, and I don't want to kind of dumb down what, what BIM management is, but the, the first kind of um, interest I had in it was probably using using Revit and then realising what data could be in, embedded inside inside a model and then what we could use it for elsewhere and, and then the whole life cycle. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't think I know what the next steps are if you are wanting to pursue this career. There, there are definitely some courses out there that you can do. There's mm -hmm. plenty of BIM management courses. There's um, accreditations and certifications that you can try and achieve. Um, BIM creds is, is, is one that springs to mind, but it's probably more for people that have been in the industry for a long time. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I can actually answer the question entirely. I think you've done well. I mean, I think. I guess to summarise, uh, look, we've we um we're really keen on, I guess, growing our initiative in Australia, and if that means we can help to, I guess, support people in terms of their um their journey in BIM, then fantastic, you know. And that's why one of the takeaways that we'll send to all of those who attended today's session is basically um, our names, our details, our LinkedIn profiles, a link to the um, Women in BIM 
registration for the website because we are rebuilding that at the moment to ensure that there's a little bit more sophistication in the way that we manage um, our group, I guess, on a global front. But in terms of Australia, really what we want to do is keep having regular catch-ups, bring in more people. If you're interested in supporting women in BIM, and we still have um, regions that aren't represented um, in Australia. So um, the ACT, Northern Territory, South Australia, and um, Hobart, the Tasmania rather. So we've got still positions available for those who, who want to support. And we also are looking at potentially bringing in um, education support, so educational leads to really answer some of these key questions um, mm. that, that have come about today. But um, if I may add one yeah. supporting comment, sure, Rebecca, and the last yeah. one, it's also yeah. because I've also have gone through the journey. I think if you have an experience or not on a BIM project, try to get close to one. If you are already on a project, um, try to understand what digital processes currently are being implemented. Because like all the other um, all the other roles and you know whether you're engineer or architecture, um, there are many components and dimension to how to implement BIM or DE. So find something that interests you and that you think is very um, triggers your passion and stuff like that, and then get closer to it, and then approach us. If not, approach um, you know the engineering firms, if not, um, sign up to what the industry trend the newsletters are and mm -hmm. just get as, as closer to, to things that you wanted to find out as possible. Or like you said, um, reach out to, to us and then we can actually hopefully be that portal to help yes, facilitate so and connect them. <laughs> so our names, um, our names are here. So please connect with us on LinkedIn if you haven't. Um, like I said, we'll be sending you uh, our, our LinkedIn details. And obviously, we're all supporting the different regions around Australia at the moment. And certainly, we're trying to drive that innovation for BIM and digital engineering across this country. So with that, um, big thank you to the panel. Really excited about where we're going next. Um, I'm really excited to be connecting with, you know, such I guess, um, innovative um, women across the industry. So thank you. And um, yeah, until next time, we hope to, to host another webinar soon. So watch this space uh, and follow us through social media uh, to learn more about women in BIM. So again, thank you um, and enjoy your day. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Samaka. Thank you. Bye. Bye.